Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Real Talk, Our Space. I am Abir Shinawa, your host today, and I am joined with my guest host and one of my BFFs. Hi, everyone. My name is Elena McCall. I'm very excited to be here. Hopefully, I can do a good job sitting in for Mr. Handy. Yes, Doug is away on vacation. Uh, it's his uh, wedding anniversary, so we wish him a happy anniversary, Doug, and I hope he's having a nice, nice time. But I'm excited that I have my good friend Elena here with me. So Elena and I know, have known each other now also since I've been in the office for about, what, no. six years now? Uh, Five so years? No, we're going on. We're going on year three. You've three. been in there, but okay. it took us a little while to get connected. There you go. And we did meet via Doug. Yep. So yep. there's that seven degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a resource teacher. And Elena was at one point for Office of uh, oh, English yeah. and Language Arts. But now you are. You got promoted to tell yes. the good people. I am now an assistant <laughs> principal, an elementary assistant principal. I'm in Baltimore County, so it's my first year. Um, yes, I started as an ELA resource teacher in elementary mm -hmm. um, and for BCS. That, but that I've been in education now going in. I mean, this is like my 16th year, probably. I think I've stopped counting after a little bit. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, yep. So did did work in the office where I got to meet a beer and Doug and make these wonderful connections and relationships. And now, yeah, I've moved into being an um, assistant principal. So hoping to take the knowledge that I gained um, mm -hmm. from my last position, especially in the space of literacy and, and, and make some changes and make some things happen on the ground. Oh, I love it. So tell us, so you've only taught elementary, correct? You're not so you didn't have I, one middle school or anything, have you? Oh, I, when I started in, I started out in PG and in PG at the time, That's right. they had sixth grade in the elementary school. Okay. And so I did teach fifth and sixth grade um, at the time it was called talented and gifted tag, mm, um, mm -hmm. the curriculum for students who are identified as being talented and gifted. Mm -hmm. And I did that. I taught English and, um, English language arts and social studies oh, okay. for two years there before moving into a resource position, still in the same school, still doing the same under the same curriculum, but resource. So that was my middle school experience, um, with sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And I have to say though, even that little bit of experience, I was like, this is why I knew I meant, I meant for elementary because <laughs> my fifth graders, I Ooh, mean, fifth grade's rough. but they were, they became my sixth graders. Oh, and when they came up. back, I was like, we've only been gone two months. What's happening <laughs> here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, What's yeah. happening here? Mm -hmm. And so it was definitely an interesting year compared to the year before with them. I see. So I would say, you know, I have a little taste of, of just a little bit, not the schedule and the environment, mm -hmm. but definitely a little bit of what the kids I think goes, go through the changes that they go through. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how do you like your new position as an AP? Like how different is it from being a teacher in the classroom? So it's different. Be, I view being an AP as being a teacher. Like I still view okay. myself as an instructional leader. Um, some of my apprehension about ever becoming an assistant principal was I didn't want to move out of that space. Mm. I have developed a passion and a love for, um, teaching adults and helping teachers to find okay. their niche and, and mm -hmm. grow their practice um, and explore and reflect. And so that was always my apprehension because in my experience, APs aren't always able to stay in that role. Right. Um, you know, when they come into a school. And so, but no, I, it, it, it's, you know, when things are meant to be, they're meant to be. And I'm in a position where that's one of the main reasons that I was selected for this school and brought on was to be um, an instructional leader Okay. In that's general, but especially in that area of literacy. So okay. I, I'm looking forward to that. I think it's it's still going to continue in ways. Are you the only AP? Because I know usually elementary schools only have one so, AP. Right. So we actually have two. Which oh, good. Is, I think why I'm also able to be in this unique situation where I can, right. I can really. Um, but, but my understanding also is that that's a shift that we're looking at in general is that, you know, administrators really are and should be the instructional leaders. Mm -hmm of their buildings, you I know, agree. of course, with a team to support, because you can't know everything about everything. Right. Um, but I I'm glad to see that that shift is happening. And so I'm excited to be a part of that. Okay. That movement. That's exciting. I'm so excited for you. I'm so yeah. proud of you. When you told me, I was like, it's, it's about time. It's about time. We need you to be in that position. So we are experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties. We're still waiting for him to log on. So our apologies. Uh, we're waiting just a couple more minutes. But our subject today, uh, which was a rhetorical, a facetious, a sarcastic uh, question is, do Muslim women need saving? Mm -hmm. So we're waiting for him just to log on so we can have that conversation. But 
it's a it's a personal topic for me, of course, because mm -hmm. me being a Muslim female, um, growing up, you know, I, I was born Muslim, so uh, for me, it's it it's a different perspective in a sense where, um, you know, people think if you're born Muslim, you're more attached to the deen or the religion, and that's not really quite the way it is. Usually, people who are kind of take it what I say, take it for granted, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy that uh, we can discuss this because being a Muslim female, I've seen how people react, mm -hmm. and I've seen what you know. That people's preconceived notions and then how they react to me and then how it changes as they get to know me. And then the concept that, you know, we're not a monolith. So that that's what we're going to discuss today. Okay. But Elena, what's uh, your perspective or your interactions with Muslim women or Muslims in general? Yeah, I have to say I, I'm excited and nervous about being a part of this conversation <laughs> because okay. my my knowledge, I'll be honest, is limited. You know, okay. a, 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 I've learned a lot from, from you mm -hmm. and our relationship. And I'm very appreciative of that. Um, and but you know, I view it as being on that cultural proficiency journey that has you know no end goal. Mm -hmm. You stay there. When, you know, once you hit, hit that level of the continuum, and this is an area that I'm looking into growing my own knowledge and my mm -hmm. own um, understanding about you know your experience and mm -hmm. and just more about the Muslim culture um, and and all the facets uh, that. That people just don't know. Like you, mm -hmm. like I said, you've you've definitely already opened my mind to things or eyes to stuff that that I didn't know. But then I, I go back to kind of what we always talk about of how in schools, you know, we don't get a lot of exposure no. to, in our instruction to, right. to learning about other cultures. And so um, we have to be willing to to communicate and start to build those relationships with each other so that we can learn from each other in mm -hmm. that way. And so I'm excited to be here because I feel like I'm on a little bit of a, a listening and learning um, tour tonight. Right. Well, I'm I'm glad you're here with me because um, you know I love having you. I'm, I'm selfish, you know that. So whatever time I can have with you, and I've learned a lot from you too. I think we've leaned on each other as you know two strong women. Um, and so you know I'm I'm just very fortunate to have you in my space and to call you among my inner circle. So I, thank I feel you. The same exact way. And I love that you're doing this too because Thanks. I will say that I feel like you know, as we're moving, as the, as the climate and the conversations continue around equity and, and diversity and, and cultural responsiveness mm -hmm. and all of that, um, there's a tendency to start, like you said, you're not a monolith, but there's a right. tendency to make the experiences of women of color, yep. this blanket statement. Mm -hmm. and so I'm excited that you're pre creating this space to be like, no, that we're not a monolith. We all right. have very um, while there might be some roots that are the same mm -hmm. that we're experiencing, absolutely, there's divergence. And, yes. and and we should be allowed to be seen and understood for that divergence. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a great, a great topic. Mm -hmm. And it's a great segue because we have a fabulous lady, Hint okay. Mekki, who is an interfaith educator and founder of Side Entrance. Hind is an interfaith and anti-racism racism educator who holds a degree in international relations from Brown University, Ohoho, a former fellow of the American Muslim Civic Leadership Institute. Hind is a founder and curator of Side Entrance, which is an award-winning website documenting women's prayer experiences in mosques. Mosques is also, for those who may not know, are places of worship for Muslims. She is currently an educator with the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, or ISPU. Hind served on the Islamic Islamic Society of North America's Mosque Inclusion Task Force and was an advisor to the ISPU project, Reimagining Muslim Spaces, consulting with American mosques on gender, economic, and convert diversity. Um, in 2018, this is really exciting, Hind was featured as one of CNN's 25 influential American Muslims. Snaps to that, girlfriend. Mm. Locally, Hind serves on the advisory boards of the Brother Jeffrey Gross, I hope I said that right, FSC Institute for Dialogue, Justice and Social Action at Lewis University, and the Chicago History Museum's exhibit, American Medina Stories of Muslim Chicago. And when I read these fabulous, you know, um, bios, I'm like, I'm so unworthy. But anyway, we're going to bring on fabulous Hind yes. Mekhi. Salaam alaikum, Hind. Your mic is off. Assalamu alaikum. Um, how are you? Assalamu alaikum. And can, you, can you hear us? How is everyone? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Yes, I can hear you well. Good, Doing good. well, as you see. So a little bit of history. Hind and I know each other for forever. 
Um, we used to be neighbors at one many point. Many years. <laughs> many, many years ago. We lived in the same apartment complex. Um, but also, Hind and her family have a special place in my heart because her mother, Sitlela, Khalilela, if you're watching, salam to you, was my Arabic and Islamic studies teacher when I was at Aqsa. So I have a debt of gratitude to her for being such an amazing teacher. She was not warm and fuzzy, which we did not need. She was an amazing, amazing educator. So mashallah, and I'm so honored to have Hind speak to us today because um, Hind is just doing some amazing work. So thank you for being a guest on our show. And Elena is my guest host today. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Hello, Elena, and thank you, Avir, for the invitation. I love that when you first uh, reached out to me on social media, you were like, ignore my last name. <laughs> you know, this is because I don't have you as Avir Shinawi on any of my information, yeah. even to this Everybody day. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah exactly. That I have to, exactly. Yeah. And, no, and it's true. Um, I... When I, when I posted about this on Facebook, I said that you're one of my childhood friends slash mentors. You're not that much older than me, but you were <laughs> the first person who, you know, that I knew, like in our community, somebody who's like me, a Muslim woman, uh, a Muslim girl at that time, mm -hmm. child of immigrants, uh, who wears a headscarf, who, you know, was involved in politics and cared about civic engagement. And right. if I remember correctly, you went down to Springfield, yes. right? As a page, or I don't really know what the... I was actually like a, Exactly, a, you were the first person. Mm -hmm. An intern with a lawyer. That yeah, changed my mind. The, well, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you were like absolutely the first like girl that I knew who did anything like that. And mm -hmm. so that's why I said mentor, even though we, I mean, like, you're not that much older than me, no, like, right. we very much uh, overlapped in school. But just to, to sort of, uh, you know, what's that phrase? Like, you can't be who you who you don't see. Right. Well, I saw you doing some things and I thought, oh, okay. Oh. I, I, know, I never knew that. Hand. That's That's really, thank you for that. Because that really has made my day. And I, I promise I will never yeah. cry on camera, but, you know, I'll cry after I'm done because, wow, that was um, that was powerful. Thank you. And I really I never knew that. So, ooh, I'll, I'll have to let that sit in with me for a second. So, um, OK, so let's get started. So our first let's just see our comments are already going up. And I love before we start, Sahar Mustafa is one of, I think, our, our famous um, people on here, but she says it is simply about a woman's right to own her identity, be it religious, gender, sexual, visibly mm -hmm. hijabi women are an easy target for white patriarchy. And I'm, we're going to talk about patriarchy in general. Mm -hmm. I think not just white patriarchy, we find patriarchy in all societies mm -hmm. as well. So hello to everybody. So Hind, mm -hmm. your first question is, tell us your family's migration and or immigration story. Sure. Um, so like a lot of uh, people who are my, you know, my generation, if you will, um, my parents came after the 1965 immigration rights, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the change of the immigration um, laws in 1965, mm -hmm. which was the international like twin legislation to the Civil Rights Act of 64. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, which obviously extended uh, enfranchisement, you know, by law anyway, to African-American citizens in the U.S. And then what happened was that U.S. immigration law changed the year after to allow for non-white uh, legal immigration. Mm -hmm. And so my parents came um, not quite in 65, but in the late 70s um, as part of that first, as part of that kind of large wave of uh, Muslim immigrants at that, you know, that kind of wave of Muslim immigrants from the non-white world mm -hmm. uh, tended to be, it's sort of, I think people would sort of divide it from 1965 to about like maybe 1985, mm -hmm. um, which after, you know, in the early 80s, Reagan again changed the immigration laws. So that wave of, Amer of Muslim immigrants tended to be already English speaking. Mm -hmm. And so my parents come from Sudan, which is a country that was colonized by the British. You know, both of them attended college uh, in Sudan um, in English. So they spoke English fluently when they came here. Um, they attended university and they came here for graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so that was, quite, you know, similar to a lot of immigrants in their uh, at that time in the 70s uh, who were like them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they, they chose to come here and it was, I don't know if this is a real story or if it was just like a joke mm -hmm. where like my dad's, uh, you know, advisor, you know, was telling him, oh, you know, you should study abroad. And, you know, my dad, 
I don't know, again, if this is real or not, but he was saying something like, well, the British colonized us and Australia is too far, and <laughs> but let's just go to America. <laughs> I love that they didn't even think about Canada. Or no, America, not at other all. Countries. America Junior, yeah. as Homer uh, always calls it. <laughs> <laughs> if that's a true story, <laughs> then um, then yeah, that's, that's what happened. And I was oh. born in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, like the Sunday before Thanksgiving, <laughs> apparently oh, there it was go. like a lot there of snow go. and it was really cold, and mm -hmm. you know, so I'm I'm very fond of Thanksgiving, even though I know it's obviously very problematic holiday right. um, in many in many ways. And so, what I do now, what I've done for the last several years, actually, is I I fast during that day. It's a Thursday for a lot oh, of Muslims. Thursdays are special days to fast. Mm -hmm. And I fast on Thanksgiving. Um, sometimes it overlaps with my birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's kind of how I try to kind of commemorate the solemnity of what happened to native the native inhabitants of this country mm -hmm. um, and and connect obviously to my own religious tradition. I love that idea I've, I, because I love Thanksgiving too. And I, I kind of have to grapple with that whole consciousness of you know, I really like it, but I know, you know, I want to stand with our indigenous brothers and sisters. So I like that idea of fasting. So I, I may take into consideration because we would eat much earlier in the winter than we do in the summer. So we'll keep it at that. Um, Hind, your, your video is, is a little shaky, but we can still hear you. So at least that's okay. All right. So we have next question. Hind, can you still hear us? Oh, no. We are having technical yes. There we oh, go. Great. Right. All right. So we go to our next question. All right, so what is side entrance? <laughs> uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so the short answer is it is a user-generated site uh, hosted on Tumblr. And I just, you know, ask women and girls to share pictures and stories of their prayer experiences in mosques around the world. Um, the long answer is that it's also become a kind of a way for me to use social media to help effect change on the ground. And side entrance, um, you know, is one of the catalysts for a national conversation and actually change on the ground yeah. uh, in US mosques, some US mosques, mm -hmm. around women's access to those sacred spaces. And so most mosques around the world and in the United States are gender segregated. Mm -hmm. And um, that looks different for different communities. And so for like the mosque that Abir and I attended uh, growing up, what that looked like was when we were little, women and men prayed in the same hall without a physical barrier. Just men were in the front and women were in the back. As the community of that mosque grew, um, and as we grew up as well, uh, women, the women were kind of slowly phased out of that main uh, hall. And we initially, you know, began to pray in, um, the classrooms, yeah. <laughs> uh, the literal classrooms that Avir and I actually, mm -hmm. you know, would spend yeah, school, high school, that, our high school days at. Right. Um, and then I think it was, yeah, we, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, like I, we would be praying in like our history classroom, you know, and, like yep. pictures of like Amelia Earhart and right. Harriet Tubman <laughs> would be on the wall. Yep. Um, and um, and then I think toward you know the end of my high school career, we women say that again. Oh, I didn't say anything. No, go ahead. Uh, we're having some tech difficulties. I think I must, I think I missed. Okay. Uh, yeah. So what happened was the community grew so big that um, women, uh, the women's prayer space ended up moving to like the quote unquote uh, rec hall mm -hmm. in the basement. And um, when I say basement, it makes it sound like it's this dank Place and it's really not. It's you know wide and spacious and well lit, mm -hmm. uh, well carpeted. But um, but it's definitely a gender segregated space. And mm -hmm. um, that mosque that I grew up attending, Abir did as well, has women uh, on the board, elected you know uh, board members. They have women on the staff. They have mm -hmm. key volunteers who are women. But that's not the case for a lot of mosques in the U.S. Uh, right. across the, the board. Um, and so what we did, uh, you know, through the Islamic Society of North America, which is an umbrella organization of mainly Sunni mosques and other organizations, um, as well as the ISPU, which is um, a think tank uh, that I'm affiliated with. We did a study called Reimagining Muslim Spaces, and we work with mosques and Islamic centers to 
be more inclusive, mm -hmm. <laughs> particularly of women, young people, and converts. So the term side entrance, though, is a metaphor, correct? Or is it because majority of mosques would have it women is, go yeah. from the side or <laughs> so, It's a metaphor, technically. It is, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. When I first started the, the website in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, it was an election year, uh, I had a mm -hmm. lot of, not a lot, but some young men would say to me, oh, well, why are you fueling Islamophobia, right? So, like, there was this link in their mind between um, challenging uh, sexism mm -hmm. within the Muslim community with giving fodder to Islamophobes because there's already this understanding that Islamophobes uh, use this, you know, this general idea in the zeitgeist that Islam is inherently anti-woman, mm -hmm. right? And so... For me, I tell them, actually, no, you don't give them fodder, right? Like, right. it's our Muslim tradition mm -hmm. for women to be involved in the mosque and to have equal access to the mosque. And you have, you know, um, in the U.S., African-American Sunni mosques, mm -hmm. especially those connected to Imam Warathadeen Muhammad community, are like the most welcoming of women. It's like, I can't even use the mm -hmm. word welcoming because women are completely incorporated um, integrated into like all levels of leadership, education, religious scholarship um, in that community, right? Uh, to the point where like if you ask like an African-American Muslim like teenage girl who goes to an Imam Warthadeen Muhammad community and you ask her, oh, do you feel like your mosque isn't welcoming of you because of your gender? She'd be like, what? what are you talking <laughs> you about? Know, like yeah. that's not really an issue. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's exactly. ironic, and you know, Muhammad is the son of Elijah Muhammad. So, you know, that that's that legacy right there going from nation subhanAllah to Sunni. And so, well, I never really knew that. I guess when I come to visit to Chicago, I need to visit um, their masajid on the on the south side and, and see, you know, what you're talking about. That would be awesome. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great yes, point. And yeah, very good. So, yes. well, go ahead. We'll have to go visit Masjid al Taqwa. I always like to give them a shout out, and I know that you like their name. Um, <laughs> but uh, name. yeah, that's an incredible org organization. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. awesome. So, question: So, how did you come to this work, or did this work come to you? Because I know some people we ask this question, they're like, "Well, it really came to me." But how did you come to this type of work? Like, because I know you majored in like you know politics um, and international relations, but does this kind of fall into mm -hmm. international relations or is this like something that you've always wanted to do? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I studied international relations in college and I wanted to, you know, I was really interested in human rights law. So I really thought that I would go into law school, although looking more into law school, I thought, okay, you know, maybe the no, law is the right. right. right um, avenue for me, um, <laughs> right? Uh, and then what happened was that 9-11 happened and everything mm. changed. And while, you know, I had had these thoughts of, you know, going abroad uh, and, you know, kind of implementing international human rights law or what have you abroad, uh, what happened was that our, our neighbors, you know, actually marched on our mosque on the night of 9-11. And what ensued was me understanding that um, our neighbors didn't know us and we didn't know them. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what our shared values were. We didn't, we just lived in, we existed in the same spaces, but we didn't have a relationship with each other. And so mm -hmm. um, I kind of chose to, to, to join that field, this, this field of uh, interfaith cooperation, this field of, you know, diversity, building relationships. Okay, I think we lost her. Oh no. I know. We're gonna have to come back. But I think she makes a really good point when she's talking about how um when she says her neighbors marched on that mosque, mm -hmm. the mosque she's talking about we both attended growing up. There she is, she comes back. Mm -hmm. And um the I was just explaining Hind about the what you were talking about for 9-11, because I was explaining how the mosque that we go to, because a little bit of a, a, a context, the, the mosque that we attend has a heavily um, Arab population. And um, there are, you know, uh, it's a very white 
uh, neighborhood at the time and it was attacked. It was basically attacked and people went and they wanted to attack the masjid or the mosque uh, in retaliation of what happened to 9-11. Mm -hmm. So Hind is speaking about her, um, what's it called? Her, her neighbors who, like you said, did not know you at all. So I'm sorry, Hind, go ahead, continue. I think there's just a lag. Mm -hmm. Hind, can you hear us? Just when you think technology is supposed to save us, right. it's not. <laughs> oh, oh no. Okay. So yeah, that's the experience that I remember it because I remember when 9-11 happened and then just, I wasn't living near that mosque at the time, but then knowing that, you know, people were ready to march and go and attack. And, and so it was a very interesting time. Very, very interesting time. So, all right, hopefully she will. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? <laughs> Are you better now, Hen? <laughs> Yay! Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were finishing. I was kind of uh, coming in. I hope you know um, our viewers uh, give us some grace of forgiveness this time. But Subhanallah, technology is just so finicky now. So finicky. I know. All right. <laughs> so you were telling us a story how your neighbors. You didn't know each other, so you thought that this would be a good way. To, so this is how you started with the work. Continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and so um, so I did a lot of interfaith work, uh, work that maybe wouldn't be labeled as interfaith because it is it was um, I was working on a grant like on a state funded program that uh, that helped green card holders become U.S. citizens, and mm. uh, through that I worked on like immigration rights. I got connected with priests and rabbis and you know people who are not religious all kinds of people and I thought okay well this kind of interfaith work that's like based on values mm -hmm. um, and issues is really interesting to me mm -hmm. so I got into that <laughs> and then uh, I worked at uh, Interfaith Youth Corps which uh, provides trainings um, to universities and through that, I had the opportunity to travel around the country, and mm -hmm. everywhere I would go, I would try to drop by a, a mosque or by the Muslim community. Um, not everywhere, but I would try to. And that was, you know, kind of one of the things I noticed, that young people are connected by social media. Um, it was uh, around the time that Black Lives Matter started to really uh, mm -hmm. gain a lot of traction online. Um, and so I thought, okay, let's, let's use social media to be as a form of catharsis mm -hmm. to particularly women who feel excluded in the mosque, but then mm -hmm. also, you know, kind of, you know, and crowdsource that, but also give solutions as much mm -hmm. as possible uh, to mosques to return to the prophetic example, because actually, um, you know, keeping women away from mosques and keeping women away from the leadership in mosques is not the prophetic example. Correct. Correct. Very, which a lot of people uh, tend to, you know, twist and utilize for their own advantages. But, you know, that's a topic for another time, Hind. <laughs> All right, next question. All right. So what are the biggest challenges you face as a Muslim hijabi doing your work? Yeah, you know, it's funny when I saw this question, I don't. In general, I don't think that I have a lot of challenges because I work in the field of like religious diversity. Mm. And actually being a woman who wears a headscarf in a pretty traditional way um, mm. actually gives me cachet within Muslim communities because, you know, um, and this is not to say that women who don't wear headscarves or who wear a headscarf in a different way than I do are not religious, right? Like I know a the women who don't cover their hair um but in some muslim circles the fact that i wear a headscarf and i'm talking to them about being more inclusive to all women um mm -hmm. that actually literally get me in the door and gives, it gives me a lot of acceptance in those spaces where i find that there are some challenges is also do interfaith work um and i think 
that for a lot of people, both Muslim and non-Muslim, they just a lot of times assume a lot of things about me, mm -hmm. particularly around like my political views. They'll assume that I'm way more conservative, small C than, mm -hmm. I, than I am. Um, and, you know, I'd be like, no, guys, like, <laughs> actually, I vote green as much as I vote Democrat. You know, right. like, I identify as, uh, um, you know, progressive uh, mm -hmm. uh, politically in the U.S. You know, it's funny because, like, uh, religiously, I'm pretty orthodox, I think, in my views, uh, very mainstream Sunni views mm -hmm. uh, in my, and in my practice. But in right. um, but for me, that, that there's mm -hmm. a real... Yeah, there's a real separation between religion and state that I believe in. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to force my views on everyone else. And at the same time, I don't want anyone to force their views on me. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, because I think I always tell people when they see me, I look more conservative than you would think, because the, the, the hijab just throws people off. So they sit there and they think, oh, you know, we're going to have this person who's like uber religious and, you know, spewing all of these things. Out. And then once they get to know you, if they want to get to know you, then it's a totally different story. Mm -hmm. So. So we know we have a lot of things that come out, especially within our own communities that, you know, boycott this or don't do this or don't follow this person. Do you believe in cancel culture? Especially in the work that you do, do because, you know, they're cancel culture ah <laughs> that's a really good question so mm -hmm. um i also work with a lot of young people right. and a lot of my work is um in uh, uh, in the online space in general no i don't believe in cancel culture i believe okay. in calling out the harm and calling mm -hmm. in the perpetrator if that perpetrator oh, like is that. able to be called in I do like that. And like oh. to give that person some education. Trade tour. I am apologizing to all of our yeah. viewers today for all of our technical difficulties. I know we have a storm coming here too as well, so yeah. I'm hoping hand. But I really like, so she says, she's calling out the harm and calling in the perpetrator. I think that is really good. Ahind, we have you actually twice now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's strange. Yes. So you were saying calling out the harm, but calling in the perpetrator. You were saying. Yeah. Yeah. As much as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, some perpetrators cannot like they they won't be they're unrepentant and they don't um, they don't want to be called in. But I think there can be processes through which perpetrators can be educated about mm -hmm. you know. The thing that the harm that they, uh, you know, perpetrated, given space to apologize and to actually address what they did to the person or people that they harm. Um, mm -hmm. And if harm was done publicly, then the apology should be also given publicly. Um, and then people should be given room to grow and flourish in general. So, yeah, I believe in calling like in that. people, especially allies, collaborators, people, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and people who, who, you know, who we can work with. Mm -hmm. I like that. So just to answer, my awesome friend, Herlene, is asking, you know, cancel culture, explain, please. Mm -hmm. So cancel culture is basically when somebody comes out, usually it's for celebrities or well-known people, and they do something and what people would consider like a grave mistake. Do we just stop following them? Is it somebody that we just want to cancel from our um, our own lives and, and society in general? So I think Ken does a, a good point because now that we have, you know, the whole Biden-Harris thing, people are, you know, putting that question mark up with, you know, Kamala Harris and her background, I suppose, with that Biden as well. But again, that's another topic for another, another show. <laughs> now, Amira, I will ask yes. a question. Is cancel culture just to people or does it, does it apply over to companies... Um, mm. organizations because I do feel like sometimes I see the boycotts and the conversation is is not just around one person mm -hmm. it's also you know around something larger so is mm -hmm. it is that taking cancer culture too far like to another realm is it really meant for an individual or is it or is it bigger than that that's a great mm. question what do you think Hint? that's a great point yeah that's mm -hmm. a great point I mean like um you know boycotting is is a really important way to engage harm, right? Like, I mean, right. boycotting mm -hmm. was one of the important 
ways that apartheid was uh, ultimately mm -hmm. defeated in South Africa. And um, it's a nonviolent way of, you know, making one's opinions uh heard and mm -hmm. i think that it's a perfectly acceptable way to do it and i don't think that boycotting is necessarily canceling altogether right it's Correct. because you're boycotting in order to move somebody or a company or something to a certain perspective and then once they get to that place then yeah you can go back and patronize them again right right and it's big right now like saha says bds boycott divestment and sanctions i think it's the s mm -hmm. so those are just those mm -hmm. are because those are also temporary Mm -hmm. When you do cancel culture, you're done with them. But you're with done. a boycott, it's more like it's temporary. And then, you know, if, you know, they get their act together, then, you know, that would work. Um, but it's also boycotting is also a form of, you know, civic action. You know, we, we saw that with the civil rights exactly. movement and the Montgomery bus boycott because they knew when you get them where they hurt, which pockets. is in their pockets. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's when people are like, oh, crap, I got to do something. So, yeah. So which leads us next question. Elena. Oh, I have a comment. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. What is a mosque inclusion task force? <laughs> um, so the mosque inclusion task force that I was part of um, mm -hmm. was created by ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, uh, mm -hmm. again, the umbrella group. And um, I joined them in 2014, but they were around before then, that committee. And what that committee wanted to do is to really kind of help mosques essentially audit where they can be more inclusive um, mm. and where they can welcome more people. And so our committee focused on um, helping mosques, particularly around women and getting women's, uh, get, you know, getting women's you know, We did was... Um, we worked with the Fiqh Council of North America. So this is a body of legal scholars mm -hmm. um, who pass, you know, legal opinions. It's like when she's getting going. I know. <laughs> I know. Come on, Hind. So an inclusion task. I want to hear more about this, but she's really involved in these heavy topics yeah. and inclusion. And I know in her bio, it talks about um, for converts as well. So people who come to the religion who weren't like we, you and I were talking earlier about being born Muslim and not born Muslim. And sometimes people who are converts don't feel like they're welcome yeah. in certain areas because, you know, people can be territorial. So go ahead, Hind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they, um, so we were, worked with them, they came up with a really important statement back in 2015, which then they made into a fatwa, which is a legal, an official legal opinion um, in 2018, which, this says three things. It affirms that every mosque in the United States should, and Canada should allow um, women to pray wherever they want to pray in the mosque. So they don't have mm -hmm. to pray behind a barrier if they don't want to. Uh, every mosque should allow women to enter <laughs> because surprisingly there's some mosques that let women in still. And um, crucially that every mosque should allow women to run for every elected position on the board oh, cool. and that the mosque should um yeah and and that the mosque should uh, create processes through which to um encourage more women to do so so i think like more than two-thirds of u.s mosques um actually allow in like their constitutions or their bylaws allow women to run for any position but uh in the board but not every mosque has that and um of about a month or two ago, I was trying to count, along with uh, another colleague of mine, how many mosques actually have women who were ever elected for presidents in the U.S. And we, between the two of us, could only come up with like four. Um, there might wow. be more. Um, but but what I've definitely noticed since 2015 is a huge uptick, massive uptick of women running for different board positions and being elected. And I think that's really critical to have women um, in leadership, like what we're talking about at the top of this, which is like, you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. And um, in our ISPU study, Reimagining Muslim Spaces, um, women, that was like one of the number one issue aside from like where women prayed um in a mosque their their second highest issue was this idea of like they want leadership to reflect them and mm -hmm. so uh that's that's what we did with the mosque inclusion task force and the fit council um and uh, you know the, the the committee the task force does other things as well but i was more focused on 
inclusion, the inclusion of women, um, as well as uh, converts and people who are racial minorities in that mosque. Mm hmm. Oh, I love that. So Sahar asked a really good question, but I'm going to hold on to that one, not ask you yet, because that's a good, heavy question. But we're going to go to the, the, the reason why you're here. Hin, do Muslim women need saving? Do they need saving? <laughs> you know, in my, in my notes, um, uh -huh. I have that, do Muslim women need question? And then my response <laughs> in my note was, LOL. <laughs> 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 it's such well we um, like I was telling no, Elena, yes. it's such a rhetorical question and it's sarcasm. <laughs> but seriously, like people yeah. are obsessed with it. So tell us, do Muslim women need saving? No. <laughs> Muslim women are more than capable of uh, if we need saving, of saving ourselves. Um, you mm -hmm. know, I think it's actually important to situate this conversation um in like kind of like what academics themselves have to say about it. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a professor from Columbia University, uh, Leila Abulogod, who wrote mm -hmm. an article and then a book literally called Do Muslim Women Need Saving? And essentially, um, it's an excellent book. And I know that you're going to put it on your like uh, curriculum yeah, my, uh -huh. uh, list for people my to, Google to read. Sites, yep. Um, or the, at least the, the article. Um, but she, she really deftly connects um, the, the portrayal in the West Muslim women as victims who mm -hmm. who like literally need saving but that portrayal does not take into account first of all realities on the ground right. um, which are often there because of colonial the impact of colonialism in much of the Muslim mm -hmm. world and um, imperialism and mm -hmm. other parts of the Muslim world and uh, like kind of international uh, market policies financial policies that Oh, she that always happens. It so and it, we're looking through the the question, the comments. Comment. Yeah, <laughs> great question. Save yeah. me, please. Thanks, Shabana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Z, save from what? Yeah. I don't know. That's a, that's what we're trying to figure out. You know, Sahara's you know laughing, rolling. Save, save from the saviors. That was funny. And the article is better. Mm -hmm. So that is an article for my Google sites. I would I'm definitely going to include it because mm -hmm. it would be a good article to answer that question. Do women? Um, needs saving as well. So you were saying, hint? yeah, yeah, and so they don't take into account like the realities that Muslim women are dealing with in their day to day lives, mm -hmm. and they also don't take into account that women, like men and Muslim women, like literally everyone else, is an agent of their own life. Yeah. You know, and um, maybe women don't the Muslim women don't feel like they need saving. Right. And so she really she writes about that uh, really deftly and importantly. Um, there are other obviously there are other scholars uh, and activists and academics who who also work on this issue. And I think it um, it goes hand in hand with the you know with maybe some of your viewers would be familiar uh, and his uh, really foundational book, uh, Orientalism, in mm -hmm. which, you know, he talks about how the West writ large um, reimagines or views the Middle East slash the Muslim world as kind of the opposite and inverse of the West, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, if in the Middle East, Muslim women wear a headscarf or women in general wear a headscarf, and in the West, they don't. Then the headscarf, in and of itself, is seen as the opposite and the inverse. Like it's the mm -hmm. opposite mm -hmm. of the of liberation and freedom, and the inverse of what uh, you know happiness and joy that mm -hmm. exists in in the West. That that right. that's the general kind of perspective. And so this this trope. Mm. Keep them coming. So here's an art. Uh, uh, website. I'm sorry. Thank you, Shabana. OpenDemocracy.net. Imperialist feminism response to Meredith Tax. So we would add that also to our Google sites. Mm -hmm. All right, Hind. You need to stop cutting off on us here. We need you. I know. <laughs> I know. This is. I was like just getting so excited and, and into it, and then and then it cuts off. I'm. I really apologize about all these technical all right. difficulties. It's just. What it's one day. of those days. It's, it is one of those days. Yeah, it's like one of it's it's like a nutshell in a mm -hmm. nutshell 2020. Oh my god, um, yes, absolutely. 
Yes. So you send us the next segue, which I'm going to have Elena ask you. So you are well-traveled. What are the most common mm -hmm. misconceptions Europeans have of Muslim women? And are they the same everywhere? And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that second part. Is it the mm -hmm. same everywhere? Yeah, you know, um, I think I have traveled and, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people who, like, I I don't feel afraid when I travel in general. Maybe I should be more <laughs> more afraid of my surroundings. I don't know. But I think that I think that a lot of Europeans do think of Muslim women, visible Muslim women, as being afraid, right? And so, mm. like, people would say to me, because I would strike up conversations, you know, just in general with people, and then they would say, oh, like, you're, you're so brave that you've come here. And I'm like, why? Is it dangerous, like, to be in mm. your city? Like, why, hmm. like wh why, why am I so brave to be, right. to be visiting? Um, and so, like, what they mean is, uh, you know, like, wow, like, your family's letting you do this. Um, um, yeah. And so, yeah, and so this idea, again, it, it goes back to this trope of Muslim women being victims and passive and uh, not, you know, and being limited in our life choices. Mm. So... We always end up going to the comments, but, you know, Sahar says literary community is doing a fantastic job of dismantling hijabi women without agency. Yes, yeah. I agree, especially young adult books. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not a big fan of with the French politics, but sexy is being available as like emancipated women. And I think it's interesting that they use that as a, a means of liberation as, you know, your body and Over. sexuality. So that's that's very interesting. Go ahead, Hind. Yeah, and actually, I wanted to actually talk about that because um, I I did go to France once, but the country, one of the countries that I go to somewhat frequently is Belgium. And mm -hmm. Belgium yes. just this summer had like kind of made international news because of Muslim women who a few years ago actually sued um, their universities and essentially mm -hmm. like the university system. Mm -hmm. Because the universities don't allow women in headscarves to like, you know, li like the law in Belgium essentially allows, um, like in other countries in Europe, uh, allows for for y universities to essentially discriminate against women in headscarves and not let them attend, not let them graduate. Mm -hmm. And so these Belgian Muslim women, including one of my friends, Fatima Zahra Yunusi, actually mm -hmm. sued um, Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they did not win the the in the national like in the equivalent of their supreme court, and so they're going to take their fight um, regionally to the to to. Oh, European I didn't know court. that. Wow. But, uh, but I think that's really it's a really interesting juxtaposition where mm -hmm. you know some you know like w like we have in the U.S. anyway we have this like. Um, you know, stereotype of French people like who are super sexy and, you know, like this idea that woman's power is in her sexuality is like a French mm -hmm. kind of tro stereotype that we have. Um, but Okay, so we'll continue while she comes on. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on what's being discussed so far, though? When she um, was saying that the sexuality as emancipation patient is a, a stereotype that we have. Was she mm -hmm. saying specifically Muslim women? Do you think, is that where the conversation was going? Say that one more time, Elena, now that Hind is oh, back on. Had, so when you, you no, uh, she can continue. So you yes. were talking about like the stereotype, right? Yeah, so it's, it's a stereotype that we have of the French that they believe that women's power lies in like their sex appeal. Um, but then they have a stereotype of Muslim women that, you know, Muslim women are because, you know, those of us who wear headscarves, that, that we're trying to hide, uh, you know, who we are as women. So mm -hmm. they, they think that mm -hmm. wearing a headscarf is actually disempowering, where when legally they're disempowering their own Muslim citizens. You mm -hmm. know, when they're telling them that you can't go to a university or you won't be hired in certain positions. You know, I can tell you countless stories of Muslim women, European citizens who, you know, didn't get their diplomas. Like they did all of their coursework, but they didn't get their diplomas or they were steered in a certain way academically or, um, you know, I knew I met a few French uh, women who were doctors and during their residency, they have to take off their headscarves. 
right? I mean, just these are things that like in the U.S., like we would really balk at, like this is mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. this is not a tradition that we have. Our tradition of secularism is not anti-religion in this kind right. of way. And in fact, the Supreme Court upheld that, I think in 2015, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the Abercrombie and Fitch uh, right. case against one of their, their women, uh, uh, Muslim employees women, mm -hmm. uh, who they hired and then fired. Right. And so, I, I, you know, I think that's really important. The other thing I want to say, hopefully I won't get cut off again, um, is some of your viewers might remember this, like, Ukrainian base of who, like, 2013, 2012-ish, their whole thing was that they would go in front of mosques or try to go into mosques and then take off their shirts, and they would be bare-breasted because that was the would, Ukraine, was you said? Way, uh, they're based in the Ukraine, but I think they were, okay. at that time, they had chap. Mm. Always when it gets really good. Yeah, I want to hear more about that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to give it down to like two more questions because this whole yeah. glitchiness is, is going around. So, yeah. And don't forget about that good that good question that was in the chat, too, that you mm -hmm. said you to come back to. I do. I have to come back to that one if we can get hidden back on here. There we go. All right, Hen Mecky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, they, they they were based in the Ukraine, but they had chapters in different European countries, and okay. uh, one of their mo most known chapters, I guess, was in France. And so they would what they would do is they would strip essentially they would take off their their tops as a way to show Muslim women as well as Muslim men like be liberated, be free. Mm -hmm. And there's this connection between their actions and what Gatry Spivak, you know, says is you know kind of like Western imperialism is white people essentially trying to save brown women from brown men, right? And so mm -hmm. like it's all interconnected. This idea of like do Muslim women need saving and mm -hmm. what what are they wearing? And they're wearing too much clothes. And you know and for me, I think that's really ironic because, um, you know, one of the bonus points of wearing a headscarf and, and dr dressing the way that I dress is that you get to disrupt the heterosexual male gaze, right? right. And like, that's, that's kind of how I see it. And, um, you know, and, and that's pretty powerful considering mm -hmm. that the heterosexual male gaze is one of the most powerful forces um, in, in history. Right, right. And, and it actually dismantles that power. As, as well. So that's mm -hmm. really, so we're going to down to two questions. We're going to do the question in the comments and then we're going to close off with that question that you said was stressing you out because you needed to figure it out. So this is the question. Good <laughs> meaty question from Sahar. She says, has Hind had experiences or challenges with anti-blackness and Muslim communities? And I think there's oh, also, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, go ahead. I was going to make a comment, but I want you to answer the question. Then I'll, I'll, I'll mention something. Cause I think, well, let me ask it this way then. So is it different when, because you are from Sudan. So is it a different take when people realize, oh, you're from Sudan as opposed to being like African-American from the States? Or is it pretty much the same mm -hmm. across the board? Um, okay, so when people first see me, they generally assume that I'm South Asian and they don't ask. They just assume. Oh, interesting. Um, and so if it happens to come up in conversation, I'll say, no, I identify as a black person. Mm -hmm. You know, my family's from East Africa. We are literally from a country called Sudan, which literally means <laughs> land of the blacks in Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I didn't choose the name, <laughs> but that's what it is. And, um, and it's a really important question of like, do I experience anti-blackness? Uh, in, in the American Muslim communities, I would say, there are, there's a ton of anti-blackness, um, but African Americans and um, black people from like. Let's go to a comment here. We have, I wonder because of strict laws and secularism in some European countries, how they differ from American Muslim women. I don't know. I haven't traveled to Europe much, but the, the laws in Europe are very interesting when it comes to secularism and the fact that they just have to want, they want to totally distract uh, themselves from that concept. Um, Ewa Hind. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry about this. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. It's 2020, like you said. Yes. 
So when people, you ask and you identify yourself and then where do people take it from there? Mm -hmm. So when, you know, when I, when I identify myself as Afri as black, as I identify myself as black, sometimes it surprises people. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that if you are a child of immigrants and particularly Arabic speaking immigrants, mm -hmm. you're treated very differently than if you are a child of African American converts, mm -hmm. if you yourself as an African American convert or from you know, the Caribbean or Latin America, um, you know, African immigrants, Muslim, Muslim African immigrants, particularly from East Africa, and, mm -hmm. and more particularly if they natively speak Arabic, are given a lot more cachet and credence, um, you know, and are seen as authentic Muslims, um, much more than, you know, African American Muslims who are obviously authentic Muslims, and many of whom have been, you know, been Muslim for generations. Mm -hmm. But it's because of the anti-blackness that a lot of Muslim immigrants bring with them already because anti-blackness mm -hmm. isn't just an American thing. Mm -hmm. And then yep. also um, the anti-blackness that exists in the system here in the U.S. And so mm -hmm. when you combine these two things, you, I would say that anti-black racism uh, among Muslims more uh, impacts more um, African-Americans. Uh, than, you know, black immigrants and especially people who, who you know, like myself. Hmm. She'll come back. But yes, see, it is, an, it is a fact. But uh, Asma, yes, it is. And this has come to, to head right now with all the social unrest that's been happening. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have a lot of, you know, store owners who are not or mainly either from the Middle East or Southeast Asia and their relationships with, and we had that con discussion, Elena, in the group thread, the uh, group text once about um, the podcast that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So, um, so hopefully Hind will be able to come back and explain that to us. <laughs> yeah. If 2020 was a show, it would be the show today. It would definitely be what was going on in this show as well. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Today, today's just been. Yes. Whole, it's been quite a day, yeah, yeah. honestly. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. I'll just finish my thought. <laughs> yes. And then we'll ask you your final question and then we'll, you know, bid you adieu because yeah, we don't want to uh, cause more stress on you either. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm sorry about this. I just, I'll just finish my, the sentence that I was going to say is that, uh -huh. uh, you know, for a lot of people, I'm ethnically ambiguous. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I know that my experience of anti-blackness is very different than, you know, people, than, than almost every other black person, black Muslim person in the country. So I right. definitely want to acknowledge that and, and say that. Yes. So, and, 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 and I appreciate your perspective on that because, you know, it is something that, um, people that we really need to address in our communities and just to answer what podcast I was talking about. Um, uh, Code switch has a podcast, which is, I believe it was this one that Sahara is also talking about the ugly truth of anti-blackness. No, not that one. I'm sorry, but it's similar to that one. So we can definitely um, discuss that. Thank you for saying she loves the imperfections and the authenticity yeah. of this video. I appreciate that. We need it. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to close you close off. We, we can talk forever because I did want to take, have your take on Urtugol, but we'll talk about that later. Cause I still can't understand the appeal, but I'm going to have Elena close this out with our popular, one of our popular closing questions. Question. Yes. If you could have someone sing an entire album dedicated to your life, which <laughs> artist would you pick and why? Did you hear me, Hen? Uh, no, I didn't hear it very, oh, very much. Okay. But I'm if reading no, Noma's it. comments about the imperfections. Oh. Yes. If Did you could have someone sing an entire album dedicated to your life, which artist would you pick ah. and why? <laughs> 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 okay, so I think it actually fits with this experience that we're having today. I would, oh, I okay. thought about this. This is the question that struck me out the most. Um, Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> because <What? laughs> A, it would be hilarious. B, yes. it would be based on a song that I knew and probably liked. And it, and then C, it would remind me, like, not to take myself so seriously. Right. Like, now I'm not stressing out 
over this because imagine what kind of a song he would make. <laughs> oh my God, I did not see that coming. I did not either. No, but it's funny you say that because my husband and I always, when we're talking to our daughters about eating something, him and I go into song about eat it, eat it. So <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> we were talking about we yeah, no, I, I love, love this. I love this. That's oh. hilarious. So. Um, that's yeah. great. I, you know, yeah, I honestly did not see that coming. I love it. Hmm, I wonder what the name of your album yeah. would be. We have to come back and see. I'm going to have to text you. You're going to have to give me an answer to that. So um, that was our last question, but I want to go through some of the comments before. Um, we have Love Kuja. She's a lot of this anti-blackness has a lot to do with culture. People need to stop mixing culture with religion, especially in Islam. Absolutely, mm -hmm. my child. Um, we have this one. Um Incognito is my favorite term and uses. Oh, I like that because she said she was kind of ambiguous. And then, you know, when she's incognito, she's incognito. So I think that's great. And, you know, it's a master of all words. Thank you, Sahar, for your um, support all the time. Did you address Kamala Harris being claimed by South Asians? And is there anything problematic about this? No, we did not. And that's a good question. Um, I mean, her mom is South Asian. And I know her dad is Jamaican, so I don't know how that would be, um, meaning she's asking, does this rub anyone wrong? Right. I think it depends on who you're talking to. I would I would sit and think that way because I know people who come from either multi-ethnic or biracial families, they tend to feel like mm -hmm. they're, they, they don't want to claim one or the other. So that's a good question, but I don't think I have agency to discuss yeah. it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, I think, like you said, people people are multifaceted. Like it's there's there's so many complexities and and, right. and, and layers to someone's identity. So right, right. Yeah, that's a good question, though. And I'm also at the point right now where identity politics doesn't work for me anymore. You know, having somebody, I'm going to vote for somebody just because, I, you know, they're Palestinian. It doesn't mean much unless they really see what they're um, effectively doing. What, so right. mm -hmm. what what their stance is. Can all kin folk, all skin folk, ain't kin folk? Ain't kin folk, yes. So yeah. hopefully if Finn can come back on, we can bid her adieu. While you are here, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. At Real Talk El Tier. We would love you to be a subscriber. The more subscriptions, the better. You can also go to our website, um, El Tier Ed Consult. And I believe I have a misspell. I'll add that later. Because, and there's Hind. We just wanted to. There you are, lady. Um, we just were going to close off, but we have all these. Thank you, Asmat, for tuning in. But Asmat asked a really good question. Did you address Kamala Harris being claimed by South Asians? And is there anything problematic about this? And Elena and I were saying, I mean, her mom is South Asian. Her dad's Jamaican. So I think people who are, you know, multi-ethnic or um, biracial kind of tend to straddle between both. And they don't want to be identified. But I don't know. You know, it depends on who you're talking to. What's your take on that? And we'll have you close us off. And hopefully you don't get cut <laughs> off. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, Kamala Harris claims being South Asian herself, you know, it's really mm. important for her, but she understands that this country socializes her as black and she identifies mm -hmm. also as a black person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she went to Howard. She's part of a, a black sorority. Mm -hmm. She definitely identifies mm -hmm. as a black woman mm -hmm. um, who is also South Asian. And that's, you know, that's what I want to say. Like, you know, I think it's Walt Whitman, right, who said that I am large, I contain multitudes. I think that's mm -hmm. true of the United States. I think that's true of every single person. And it's mm -hmm. especially true of people who are biracial or multiracial. Now, for South Asians to claim uh, Harris, I'm not South Asian myself, but if I can give advice, and that is, you know, claim her, go ahead. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. she <laughs> claims her, being South Asian for her own self, mm -hmm. but also like address anti black racism wherever you see it, because you can't just claim the people who are successful and the people who are mm -hmm. kind of bring light to your community. Uh, mm -hmm. and and not actually deal with the challenges that you have with the other aspect of her identity like she's not just south asian yeah she 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 does fully identify as a person whose mother is from india and she's right. very clearly uh connected mm -hmm. to her mom and her mother's culture and, mm -hmm. and all of that but you can't claim uh her for yourself as as a south asian person without also claiming her blackness yes 
Right. Yeah. Exactly. And um, and that's also you know great points as they say. Thank you, Kelly, for joining in. But, you know, Shabana says, hashtag not all South Asians are claiming her. So we have somebody who's, I guess, speaking <laughs> on, uh, on that behalf. But like I said, it, I don't have agency to discuss it. But mm -hmm. I think my point now is I don't believe in identity politics as much anymore either. You know, you can be whatever you want to be. Mm -hmm. It really gets to more um, right. what the work that you're going to do. You know, so, you know, as a Palestinian, you know, exactly. we were all for Bernie Sanders yeah. and Bernie Sanders was Jewish. And we were just like, you know what? I'm a Bernie is all the way. Yeah. So I think, you know, the identity politics exactly. really comes down to. Yeah. yeah. So as a, um, as a black woman, I haven't even honestly even paid too much attention to right. that whole debate. Is she African-American? Is she it, right? You know, it's it's not about that. Mm -hmm. it, it's, right. It's really not. Right. Right. So, so we wanted to make sure again, Hind, you know, tell your peeps to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, I will have this up along with some more information on our website for people to gain more information. Thank you so much for being here, regardless of all the glitches. Yeah. Um, love having you love reconnecting with you again. It was a pleasure to have uh, Elena as my, my guest host. It was a pleasure to be here. I, know. I, I, I enjoyed the conversation thoroughly. I love it. I love it. So any final thoughts or words before you leave, Hint? Thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, yeah, I'll definitely tell all the folks to follow you. I already uh, suggested you as some uh, as a resource for somebody earlier today um, oh, for their work. Uh, yeah, and, and you, you had one question I didn't get a chance to answer, and that's that, the question of, like, what advice would you give to young yes, women? Yes, it's right and here. Go ahead. Advice to everyone, and that is get yourself a mentor, especially mm. women. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people are, most people are willing to help uh, yes. and, you know, kind of learn about women in history. You'll be surprised and inspired. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And, you know, I, my new mantra is, um, you know, as queens, we fix each other's crowns. We don't put each other down. And that's exactly what we need to do. So thank you, Hen. Uh, I love you. Give my salam to Khala Thank Leila. You. Inshallah, when I come to Chicago, we have to get together and I miss her and I have to see her and you as well. So, um, I yes. will, absolutely. Thank you. Thank we'll you so. we'll see you soon, to inshallah. Give my mom and, and the whole Ramadan clan. <laughs> I will, I will, inshallah. All right, Habibti, take care. All yeah, right, salam. thank you, and thank you, Elena, for your for your co-hosting as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. It was my pleasure to sit in. All right, thank you, and yalla, salam. Right. Goodbye. Oops. Oh. I know. So that was great. So let's just see the final comments. Um, thank you, ladies from Zila. Shabana says, I want to reiterate for the Muslim U.S. leadership. I want everyone to acknowledge that Hind is an important national level leader of the Muslim American community. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. And a smart, beautiful. I would like to thank everybody. Yes, we all love Hind. And like I said, I grew up with her and it was so nice to, you know, see her in the light that she's in and um she comes from also a, a strong family like i said her mom her father you know may he rest in power Lirhamu ahmed meki was also very strong politically yeah. as well in sudan and here so she comes from you know very very solid foundation yeah. so so there you go elena we kind of answered the question do muslim women need saving mm -hmm. and we know the answer is no no <laughs> <laughs> no so yeah. i I can't thank you enough for being my guest host. I oh, appreciated it. Um, definitely going to have you on again. I think it would I be would great. Love to come back. Yes, yes. So, you know, for now, again, everybody, uh, you know, wait on our website. I'll have a lot more information. And um, for, oh, next week, I forgot to talk about what we have next week. So, next week's show, since we're still in August and we're talking about women in leadership, we have Vilma Nahera who is an assistant principal of Kinsey Orchard High School in Montgomery County. She will be discussing women in leadership and especially the importance of, you know, having our Latina women in leadership and in the, in, in that, uh, in that realm, because, yeah. you know, we're talking about black and brown girls as well. And the importance of our uh, Latin sisters being represented and what right. we can do to help our students as well. So tune in for that show next week, yeah. which uh, will be also a great show. Our music is produced by Corey Carter. You can follow him on Twitter at Mr. Carter teach. And I know he yeah. is, they're having a baby soon, so that's exciting. Yes, yeah. yeah, so for the time being, I'd like to say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Elena, again. And everybody, good night. Good night. Bye.